Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? All of you? All right, so I will do a, a mic. Uh, and thanks Mark for putting me in the session together with the talk on sex workers and uh, the, the idea of beauty construction. And I mean it, because I teach a course on law and gender. And there are not many males teaching a course on law and gender. So it's a good, good coincidence, a good research in my mark. I don't know. So I'm going to talk about uh, humanizing the corporation. And uh, the central idea that I'm going to try to convey today is going to be this. That why should we humanize corporations and how can we do it? I think this picture should look very familiar to many of you or all of you. This is Hong Kong Harbor. But this is not very, very different from the harbors around the world in one way. Can you find that out? What is one distinctive aspect of this picture which you can find elsewhere as well? Sign it. That's right. So one thing that you will notice anywhere in the world is these signs, corporate names. And these corporate names are competing amongst themselves which one should be placed better and higher and become more prominent. This is about corporate power. And you see these names, Samsung, Philips, Hitachi, and others, Olympus here, and many more. So what I'm talking about here, if you look around, you'll find that the corporations are like God. They're omnipresent, they're everywhere. Can you think of anything in this room that we can do without companies? Think for a while. <laughs> no. That, that's a good spontaneous response, but there are but there are specialized companies offering sex tourism. There are companies specializing in human trafficking for sex workers. So what I'm talking about here is that even this TED talk, TED is a non-profit corporation incorporated in the US. So what I'm talking about, what we eat, and that goes to the idea of construction of beauty canvas before, everything we do is decided by companies for us and we have a false sense of choice. And you see some of the things, whether it's about our basic needs, health, food, how we do our banking, internet, privacy issues, telecommunication, travel, you name it. And more recently you will see companies are fighting wars for us, the states. The states don't need to fight anymore the wars. Private securities, detentions, interrogation and capture of terrorists, all this is done by companies. And it's not merely the kind of activities that companies are doing that is amazing. It's also the power that I'm talking about here. If you look at the dynamic in this, what you will notice is that some companies like Walmart and McDonald's, they're hiring millions of workers. And that could be, there's a top 10 companies including the public sector departments you will see there. And Walmart at this point of time is 2.2 million workers in fact, is right up there. So that shows the power of companies. But it's not merely the power of companies in terms of how many people they are hiring because you can also multiply it in terms of the number of people who are going to be in a family. So they are deciding the fate of so many thousands and millions of families. The next point I want to highlight is, is also the revenue. Walmart, I mentioned, the revenue of Walmart at this point of time is close to 470 US billion dollars. We have about one, 195, 196 countries in the world. 170 countries of the world have their GDP less than Walmart alone. So if you put up in the list of companies and GDPs the states, 
Walmart is going to come there somewhere 25th in the world. Let us look at a company closer to us, Sinopac, a Chinese company. It has revenue 411 billion US dollars, which is bigger than Denmark or countries like Singapore, Thailand, South Africa. I hope some students are there from these countries. So you can understand what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about these all pervasive and highly powerful companies and the task before us is how could we humanize them for the 21st century. What drives companies? I think all of you know it already. Profit maximization. This is the underlying idea behind companies. And Milton Friedman was one of the key architects of this idea who argued that the only social responsibility of company is to maximize profits for shareholders. So it's not mere earning profit. You can earn profit, but that is not enough. You must earn maximum, not for the whole society minded, only for the shareholders. And that is the only objective of establishing a company. So today I wish to question and challenge the appropriate of appropriateness of this particular idea. Because when we talk about profit maximization, there are negative externalities and economics students could relate to that, what I'm talking about. You see this picture, probably you can't find out. But this picture is of a pyramid in Cairo. It doesn't look like because this is part of the pyramid. When we talk about profit maximization, it results in serious consequences for society and that are, those are depicted in this picture to some extent. When we talk about profit, it is an unending race. So you have these school kids who are not happy with only climbing at the first step of the pyramid. There is competition going on, who can go higher, right? That is one aspect of profit maximization. But where do you stop? Something that you don't see here, when you go to the top of the pyramid, where do you go then from there? And what is it? Is the profit making an end in itself? Ask Bill Gates. Ask Warren Buffett. The second consequence that you see here is that when you focus on any one particular goal in your life, obsessively or solely or primarily, you forget about other things. And that is what is happening here. The kids are not aware of the importance of the pyramids or the need to preserve them. They are obsessed with climbing up and going higher and higher. That's what companies are doing. When you focus on maximizing profits, then you forget about the negative consequences on society. And that's why we need to question it. Now let us look at some concrete negative consequences of profit maximization. On your left, you'll see this picture, again with a picture I took a couple of years ago. This is River Nile. And you see the amount of pollution and rubbish in River Nile, which is something similar to what I thought uh, the River Ganges is in India. You'll see some plastic bottles here. And I think most of you will think, oh, we should be holding these uh, people responsible for this pollution. I will go one step further. Why should these companies who are selling water bottles be not accountable for this rubbish ending in river night? Analyze what is happening here. Water is a common good. It does not belong to any one of us. We can only take as much water as we need it. But what is happening here is companies are making it a private property. They take the water out of the earth free of charges, put it in the bottle and sell it to all of us. Do we need this? If you look at the old days we're talking about, I'm not talking about old days, yesterday, really old days, when the means of transport were not there, people used to walk and ride on horses, they needed water of course even that point of time. But then kings at that point of time used to provide water at sports at a fair distance free of charges of course. 
now you are making money out of it. So you see these soft drink giants and the companies selling water, they are taking a natural resource which belongs to all of us and making private profit out of it. When you see the labor right abuses here and that is why you see this outsourcing, that is why China has become the biggest factory in the world. You can abuse labor rights. Other Asian countries are falling on the same. So if the wages in China are going to go up as they are already going, they are looking at Bangladesh, they are looking at Vietnam, they are looking at Thailand, they are looking at Sri Lanka now. And that is why you, you try to minimize the, your cost and that results in uh, multiple labor right violations. That is not merely about violation of labor rights, there are serious human rights issues as well. Many companies will compel women to undergo pregnancy tests before they are hired. Because if a worker is hired and she gets pregnant, then the company might have to pay maternity benefits. That is not good for their profit. And that is why the workers might have to undergo that kind of a thing. Airlines used to have a written clause in the contracts of their hostesses, some still have, that you will not get pregnant while you are working for us. We are talking about these companies at that point of time. Even if they are able to bypass this barrier, then the women are suffering other kinds of disadvantages, human rights violations, unequal play, unequal pay is fairly known, sometimes their wages are cut once they get pregnant and of course they do not get promoted to the high positions. Women, if you look at the data anywhere in the world, do not have high percentage in terms of the uh, positions at the top. Should it be like this? Has it been the like this? If you look historically at the institution of corporations, that was not the idea. Corporations as an institution, it was created historically as a public institution. If you look at the origin, if you look at the history, states used to grant a very specific charter to a company to do a public project. A building has to be built, we need a bridge here, we need a tunnel here. So the company is going to get a license from the state to do that particular task which is going to benefit all of us in society for a limited time. The project is done, the corporate license is gone. Or even if the license is not gone, you have to apply for the renewal of license again. But that is not the case we are talking about now. Now companies can stay forever. They can do whatever they want and they are not really controlled by states. So historically, companies were created, what I will argue is uh, traditionally they were social institutions. But at this point of time, of course, they are not. You, you can't see the present before here, but that used to be, that should be here. But the future, in my view, should be rooted in the past the history of corporations, otherwise it is going to harm both companies as an institution as well as society. Another idea that I would like to question today is the often commonly accepted distinction between profit making companies and non-profit companies. I find this problematic because the assumption is that if you are a profit making company, Human rights is your not business. You can pollute the environment, you can violate labor rights because your focus is on maximizing the profit. On the other hand, here the assumption is here you can just do some charity, philanthropy for the society, doing some noble cause. This is problematic. It is problematic because every social institution must fulfill certain collective common goals, whatever that society has at, at a given point of time. We also have the idea of a social business, which is a nice idea, but again, why do we need to have this idea? Because what we need in my view for the future is this, that every institution must do and must comply with certain common objectives. Let me take some examples here. Companies are not the only institutions in society. This university is a social institution. 
Then in this picture you will see some religious institutions. You see the church and you see the Hindu temple there. These are older institutions than the institution called the corporation. They have certain specialized functions, like university has specialized functions. But can a university say that because our job is to impart education and uh, enhance learning, if sexual harassment is taking place inside the campus, none of our business. Can the church make this argument that we are here to promote religion and religious feelings and right to religion and all this? And if there is sexual abuse, don't talk about it. Can a Hindu temple, because under Indian law, a deity is considered a separate person. So an idol in a Hindu temple could be as good as a company. It can own property, it can file a case, it can sell a property, it can do business. But can this deity make this argument that here we are doing the religious stuff and that's why if there are certain rights of women that have to be violated, we have to accept it, don't talk about it. So let's take one more example, family as an institution. It is a social institution with certain special functions. Let me take a scenario here. Let us contemplate a family where the parents have four kids. And let us, let us imagine that they face a tough economic situation. What are they going to do, parents? Do you think they are going to kill one of the child? But that is what companies do. If a company has four workers and the company is not making enough profit, they are going to dismiss one or two. That is, that is the difference between the corporations as an institution and family as a separate institution in society. So what I would like you to consider is that there are many and multiple kinds of social institutions. Companies are only one of them. Every social institution has certain functions, but apart from performing those special functions, there are certain collective goals of society, human rights for instance, or saving the planet or environment. They must be complied with by all social institutions. Now we talk about balancing a lot at this point of time. We should try to balance. Now in some cases, we can balance these conflicting goals, but in many cases, it is not possible. It is merely a talk that we should try to balance. This is Saturday evening. I should be at home. Why I am here? My family is waiting for me. How do I strike this balance? There is no balance here. This goal is trumping the time I should be spending with the family. That's what I also would like to analyze and apply here. If the social goals are superior, human rights are superior, they should prevail over profit maximization if the balancing is not possible. Now, how do we humanize corporations? On the left side, you will see a picture, and Cathay Pacific was mentioned earlier. You see this, this is called Humanizing Company 1.0. You can link it back to what I will talk about in the title of my project. You do not, when you call a company, you do not want to talk to a machine. And that's why to make more profit, companies are trying to put a human face to their artificial nature. And you will see many companies doing it. What I find problematic, this is good, we should have it. But what I find problematic here is that the companies are doing it to maximize profit. That should not be the case. Profit maximization is fine, you can earn profit, but it should be subject to complying with the social responsibilities of that particular institution. So it should be in the blood veins of a company. Everything a company does should be consistent with that. How do we do it? One recent instance is this uh, Indian Companies Act, which was enacted only this year. And what you will find interesting here is that the law is providing that, again, some, some text is missing here, but the crucial text you can still see that at least 2% of the net profits, the companies, the big ones, must spend on these things. And these are the, the global challenges we are facing. We can't expect merely the state 
to take care of these things. We can't expect merely the non-profit civil society to take care of this. Every social institution has to work to overcome these challenges and that's why this law perhaps is a step in the right direction. There are certain uh, limitations of this law. For instance, uh, it only applies to big companies. Why should it be limited to big companies? Every business should take care of the people and society around it. The contribution should vary, of course, but every company should have those obligations. This is my younger son, and I think this shows uh, the limitation of law. Because law operates within its boundaries and within its institutions. And sometimes if you are outside the boundaries of law, you cannot penetrate. You may not have access to the court. You cannot go to the judicial system. There could be corruption. And that's why law can try to humanize business and companies, but it is going to have limitations always. And that's why all of us have a role to play. Each one of us in this society, in this lecture theater has a role to play. We are part of the company. We are part of the company, could be as investors, could be as consumers, could be suppliers, could be employees. So we need to control these vices that they may be there. If as an investor, I am greedy about the profit I should be making, this is not good. Because we wear multiple hats. Something which is good as an investor may not be good for me as a father, as a consumer. And that's why I should be aware of these multiple responsibilities that we have. And this is quite crucial. And I will finish with this. And what you see on your right hand side is the old phone. And I think you can relate to this. Now this is my phone. This is more than four years old. I still have it. And I'm not changing it because it's still working. But do we do that? We don't do it. So what I'm asking you to do is consider do we need certain things? We keep on buying new phones every three, six months or new gadgets. Do we need it? All of us have a role to play in humanizing the corporations. And I would strongly encourage all of you to consider doing it and making a contribution. Thank you very much.